We're going to close our series, I guess you could call it, the last, I think, eight months on the book of Judges, with Judges chapter 21. So if you want to be turning there with me, Judges chapter 21, I'm going to give you just a recap of what's been going on in the book of Judges, and then we will pray, and then we'll jump into this chapter together. Because, so remember, the book of Judges begins with the death of Joshua, basically. So to go back even further, Joshua was Moses' like second in command guy who Moses turned over the, the leadership of Israel to when Moses died, or I guess before Moses died. And Moses had given the book of Deuteronomy to the people as they're on like the edge, like the border almost of the promised land. And he said, these are all the things you're going to do. These are all the things you need to do. Here's what this is going to look like for you. And one of the commands that God had given them was a hard one. And we talked about this already. But God had told them, go in and wipe out the Canaanites. Wipe them out. No one left. Don't make treaties with them. Don't make covenants with them. Don't marry their daughters. Don't worship their gods, for goodness sake. Kill them all. And we wrestled with that and how hard that is and how God had given this one specific command at this one specific time in history, this was not a thing that was to continue. It was you go in, you take the land, this is my judgment on these people, and then it'll be yours to possess. And the first thing they did was to not do that. I guess they go with Joshua and they have one or two victories like Jericho, and then Ai is a semi-victory after the fact, and several others, but then they very quickly make a treaty with a group of people who are Canaanites. And that goes badly for them. And then as we open up the book of Judges, we see every single tribe listed and every single tribe's failure to obey God and to do what God had commanded. And so we had that introduction to the book of Judges where it said, basically, people are going to fail. This is God speaking. He said, you guys are going to do wrong. I'm going to judge you. I'm going to raise up a ruler for you who's going to lead you into repentance and redemption. But you're going to do it all over again. And they do, over and over again. Disobedience, failure, idolatry, other things. And God judges them. He raises up judges. And so that's what we've seen, just this pattern. And now we're here at the end of the book of Judges. And we have this story, this long-form story of the Levite and his concubine and all that went on with them. And so she's dead. He has called all of the people of Israel to come and fight against Gibeah. Remember, because Gibeah was the ones who had done this horrible thing to this woman. And the Benjaminites, who were the tribe that Gibeah was a part of, instead of saying, yes, we agree, we have, to, we have to bring judgment on them, they defend them. And so Israel goes into the civil war. And what should have been like a 20-minute battle lasts for three days, and there are 50,000 dead. And so Benjamin now has basically no one left. There are about 600 men left in the tribe of Benjamin. And that's what we're going to pick up today. And we pray for us, and then we'll, we'll read our text. Father God, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you that we have individual copies of it, that we have good translations, that we can read your word for ourselves. Lord, today we ask that as we read your word together, that you would open our eyes to see your goodness, to see the wickedness of our own sin. Lord, that you would draw us back to Jesus or that you would draw us to Jesus for the first time. Lord, we ask this morning that as we do this, you would convict us of sin, that you would challenge us and inspire us to be holy people, that we would recognize how serious your commands are and that you would make us into people who look more and more like Jesus. Lord, we ask your blessing on our time together as we read your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Judges 21.1. Now the men of Israel had sworn at Mitzpah. That's where they had gathered, remember, to go to battle. They swore this. No one of us shall give his daughter in marriage to Benjamin. And the people came to Bethel and sat there until evening before God and they lifted up their voices and wept bitterly, and they said, O Lord, the God of Israel, why has this happened in Israel? 
that today there should be one tribe lacking in Israel. And the next day the people rose early and built there an altar and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the people of Israel said, which of all the tribes of Israel did not come up in the assembly to the Lord? For they had taken a great oath concerning him who did not come up to the Lord to Mizpah, saying, he shall surely be put to death. And the people of Israel had compassion for Benjamin, their brother, and said, one tribe is cut off from Israel this day. What shall we do for wives for those who are left, since we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them any of our daughters for wives? So remember, the Israelites had come through Benjamin. Basically, it said they burned every town and basically killed everybody. And there are about 600 men left. And they said, basically, what's going to happen is, if we don't get them wives so that they can have families, Benjamin is going to be no more. There's going to be no Benjamin left. Or they're going to go marry Canaanites, and that's going to be just as bad. They're going to disappear in another way. So they said, what are we going to do? We got to do something. And they asked God, God, why did you do this? Why is Benjamin cut off like this? I mean, the answer is obvious. Benjamin chose that. They chose that. God didn't do it to them. They decided they were going to be evil and embrace evil. And so God cut them off as judgment. And then they said, okay, what if we do this? And this is, you can see the, the beginnings of this. They said, which tribe, did anybody not come to battle? Because we swore another oath. Not only are we not going to give our daughters to Benjamin, so that's not an option. Is there anybody that didn't come? Because maybe we can get daughters from them and they can marry the Benjaminites. And that'll work. Now you're already seeing, this is not the beginning of a good story. Right? Things are not going well already. Because they said, anybody who didn't come shall surely be put to death. Now notice, they ask God a couple of questions here, and God does not answer. And we're not going to get an answer from God in this story at all. God is completely silent to all of their questions, to all of their, their wails and their sadness. God is completely silent. God's not involved in what they're about to do. Verse 8. They said, What one is there of the tribes of Israel that did not come up to the Lord to Mizpah? And behold, no one had come to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were mustered, right, they were, when they were gathered up, behold, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. So the congregation, and here's where it gets crazy, sent 12,000 of their bravest men to Jabesh Gilead and commanded them, Go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, also the women and the little ones. This is what you shall do. Every male and every woman that has lain with a male, you shall devote to destruction. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young women who had not known a man by lying with him, and they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. So, Maybe this sounds familiar to you. If it does, it should. Because what's going on here is they have taken God's command, which God originally gave them to go in and wipe out the Canaanites, and they have turned this command that they did not fulfill onto Benjamin, or excuse me, onto Jabesh Gilead. And they said, so we didn't do the thing we were supposed to do with Canaan, but because they didn't do this thing that they didn't know they were supposed to do, and we swore this oath, now let's go and kill the men and the women and the children, and we'll steal all the young women who aren't married yet and give those wives to Benjamin. That's not a good plan. Let me just tell you. Let's just let's say that out loud. That's not a good plan. God is not a part of this. God didn't tell them to do this. They decided this on their own. Verse 13. Then the whole congregation sent word to the people of Benjamin who were at the rock of Ramon and proclaimed peace to them. And Benjamin returned at that time. So basically said, the, the fight's over. You guys come back. They gave them the women who they had saved alive. Notice that phrase, like they had done something good. They gave the women whom they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead, but they were not enough for them, right? So they only had 400 girls and there were 600 men. And the people had compassion on Benjamin because the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. So their compassion was good and their actions were not. Verse 16, then the elders of the congregation said, what shall we do? We need more women. How can we steal some more women? What shall we do for wives for those who are left? 
since the women are destroyed out of Benjamin. And they said, we have another horrible idea. There must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin, that a tribe is not blotted out from Israel. Yet we can't give them wives from our own daughters, for the people of Israel had sworn, cursed be he who gives a wife to Benjamin. So they said, behold, there's the yearly feast of the Lord at Shiloh, which is north of Bethel, on the east of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Labona. And they commanded the people of Benjamin saying, go and lie in ambush in the vineyards and watch. If the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in the dances, come out of the vineyards and snatch each man his wife from the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. And when their fathers or their brothers come to complain to us, which they will, we will say to them, grant them graciously to us because we did not take for each man of them his wife in battle. Neither did you give them to them else you would now be guilty. So they said, well, we can't give the, they, they can't give the girls to these men in marriage because they swore this oath, but we can get around this. So you guys, here's what we'll do. Because this is how every good romance starts. Go and hide on the highways. And when the girls come out to dance, just find one that looks good and kidnap her and then marry her. And when her dad comes and says, I, I didn't want that to happen. Where is my daughter? Give me my daughter back. We'll say, well, this really was a good idea because they needed wives and you couldn't give them. And so now we fixed it. Goodness gracious. Verse 23, and the people of Benjamin did so. And they took their wives according to their number from the dancers whom they carried off. Notice just the language here. They carried them, they snatched them and carried them off. You're like, what is going on? They rebuilt the towns and lived in them. And the people of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and family. And they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. And here's the last verse of this story and the last verse of all of the book of Judges. And it, it is a perfect end. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So, Again, I've said this several times. It's tempting to read the Bible, read a story, and say, well, here's what the characters in the story did. This is what I should do. And so, you know, if you're a single young guy, you're reading this story, don't go steal a wife from the highway. Don't go and kill a whole town of people and steal a wife from there. That's not what's going on here. God is teaching us something different because God is completely silent in this. Every man did what was right in his own eyes, not God's eyes. God didn't, he didn't condone this. God just let them do their evil as he waited in judgment. So I think we learn a couple of things, a couple of things from this. One that I didn't include, and I'll just say this really briefly at the beginning, is that stupid oaths are stupid. Don't, don't, swear something that you know you can't fulfill or that you know you shouldn't fulfill, right? They got themselves in this mess where they made this oath that, well, we can't give our daughters to Benjamin. Anyone who does is cursed. And they made another oath where they said, anyone who didn't come to battle, we have to kill them. And so they got themselves in this really bad predicament. And they kept their integrity, I guess, but they had to do horrible things in the process. All right, but here's number one. Here's number one. This is the real number one. Sin makes everything a mess. Sin makes everything a mess. This whole story is just a mess. They, they do one thing wrong, and that makes them have to do a different thing wrong, and they do that, and now they've done this other thing wrong. And really, we can go all the way back to the beginning of the book of Judges, and they are facing the consequences of their failure to fulfill the conquest that their great, 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 great grandfathers failed to do. It's just like the sin, the mess just continues. We see this happen all the time, right? The parents sin, and they make a mess for the kids, and the kids sin to try to get out of the mess, and they make the mess worse. Sin makes everything a mess. And here's A, every action has consequences. Every action has consequences. So like I said, they're facing the, the consequences of their great-great-grandfather's failure, and it has just 
trailed on all the way to now to where they flip the conquest onto their own people and they go and wipe out an entire town because somehow they had, remem- maybe they remembered these words from Moses way back when. Maybe they had been passed, I'm sure they had been passed down. Hopefully they had been read at some point because the wording is so similar where they say, you know, devote them to destruction. That was the word that God used. That was the phrase that God used of the Canaanites. But this thing had trickled down. And, and we see this all over this. So Benjamin defended the sin of Gibeah. And so they were almost wiped out. And they needed wives. And so this whole mess happens. And really this whole situation of this final ark was caused by the spiritual adultery. They had married into Canaan and they had worshipped idols for so long that they had really forgotten. I mean, let's be honest, a town like Gibeah, where they did that, what they did to that young woman, does not rise up overnight. That took a long time to where they got to that point. Every action has consequences. Proverbs 22, 8. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of his fury will fail. In other words, you, you do wrong, you're planting seeds for the future, and the seeds that you're planting are not good. If you ever planted a garden from a seed, it's a lot of work, right? You plant the seed, and you water it, and all that, and you watch it. It takes a long time, and then if you planted a tomato seed, Lord willing, and you don't have birds and deer and everything, you, you get tomatoes. Or if you plant something else, like if you take a bunch of weeds out of your yard and throw those into a garden, those weeds are going to grow, and they will grow well. If you've ever driven down any of the, like any part of 820, when it's like early summer, like right around now, and they haven't mowed yet, you've seen some of these weeds that are like six, eight feet tall almost. That's what's going on. He says, you sow injustice, you reap calamity. Whatever kind of seeds you plant in your life, if they're sin seeds, what you reap is destruction, calamity, chaos, ruin, things you don't want. And that's what they had done in Israel. They planted sins, or seeds of sin, and they, rep, they reaped, excuse me, calamity. Or here's Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So he says the same thing Paul does. You pick, you either sow sin and reap destruction and corruption, or you sow godliness, he says here, sow to the Spirit, and you reap eternal life. But this phrase right at the beginning, this is one that hangs in my mind sometimes. God is not mocked. You reap what you sow. God is not mocked. In other words, what he's saying is if you plant seeds of sin, sorry, that is hard to say, seeds of sin, plant seeds of sin, sin seeds, You reap destruction no matter what. And if you plant sin seeds and you look and you hope that you're going to get beautiful flowers from them, he says you're mocking God and God is not mocked. What you plant, what you reap, or what you sow, you also reap. Sin leads to destruction. Actions have consequences. The truth is your sin is never just, you never get just your own consequences. It always involves somebody else. Sin is never isolated, right? Sin is not sin on accident. God wasn't just sitting up in heaven and decided, "Mm, I think I want lying to be a sin. Let's have adultery be a sin. Um, How about drunkenness? That'll be a sin. These things are a natural outflowing of God's design. Sin is sin because it damages something that God has made. And usually it damages other people or God himself when we sin. And so God didn't accidentally choose these things. He, sin is sin because of the consequences that it, it bears, right? You commit adultery, you destroy your family. You, you steal, you harm the person you've stolen from, you ruin the economy, you, all kinds of things. You lie, you damage trust in relationships, you cheat in business, you end up with no reputation and no business. There are consequences to sin. Those are just some obvious examples But here's the thing. Whatever sin we think we secretly commit is never secret and it's never free of consequences. Every sin plants a seed for the future. So run from your sin. Run to the Savior. 
Don't linger in it. Don't water those seeds. Don't plant more seeds. Don't hold on to it. Don't protect it. Bring your sin to Jesus and lay it at the cross. Here's the promise of 1 John. 1 John 2, 1 through 2 says this, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so you may not sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And that word propitiation, we said, this is that Jesus satisfied God's wrath against sin. We have an advocate. And then here's 1 John 1, 9, which actually comes before, but it makes sense in this order. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I'm not going to promise you that, well, we'll get to that. All right. So bring your sins to Jesus. Don't let them linger. Don't plant more. Here's B. Good intentions never justify evil actions. Good intentions never justify evil actions. The people of Israel wanted to do a good thing. They had compassion for Benjamin, it says. And so they wanted to give them wives so that that tribe would not be wiped out. And yet they went about it in a horrifying way, right? Instead of... I don't, I don't know what you do in that situation. I guess you go and say, Lord, we made a stupid oath, but we're going to, we, we, got, we got to give them wives. And you take your broken oath on your own head. Instead, what they did so that they could keep their oath and sort of protect themselves in that way is they went and wiped out a village and stole the young women. And then they snatched women off of the highway. Their intentions were good, but their actions were evil. And this is immediately obvious to us, I think. What they did was wrong, no matter what they were trying to do. What they did, the way they went about it, was wrong. Maybe you've heard the phrase, the ends justify the means. Or sometimes, the ends justify the means. And what people mean by that usually is, well, as long as the outcome is good, it doesn't really matter how we get there. Like, you know, we need a new church building. So, let's steal from the community. Let's rob like 15 houses and see if we can gather up enough money to make it happen. No, that's crazy. That's not right. Our intention is good. Our action will be bad. Or we want people to come to church, so let's just, let's manipulate them and trick them into coming. That's not good either. Or my kids need to learn to be respectful, so I'll just scream at them until they learn to listen to me. That's not good either. The, the intention is good. The action is wrong. As Christians, we should be sure that not only our ends are good, but that also our means are good. That the way that we get to this good thing is also good. And the truth is that that's not always quick. It's not always expedient. Sometimes it's uncomfortable to get to a good end in a good way. But God demands this of us. God doesn't just ask us to have good outcomes for our lives. He asks us to live godly lives. Here's Galatians 5, 19 through 23. You probably know this. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things, there is no law. In other words, God says, look, here's two, there's two ways of life here. It's not, he's not saying, here are the things I want you to accomplish. Whatever it takes, go do that. No, he says, this is the kind of person that I want you to be. That, that is the thing that God wants from us. And so here's the little the blank there. God is much more concerned with our character than our accomplishments. God is much more concerned with our character than our accomplishments. In fact, the right thing for the Israelites to have done in their situation was to say, you know, the Benjaminites, they don't have wives. We're in this bad situation, but rather than try and fix it ourselves and make it way worse, let's just ask the Lord for help and let's trust him to, to work it out. Instead, they took it into their own hands. But God is much more concerned with our character than our accomplishments. Colossians 3, 9 through 10. 
Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices. And here's the important part. You've put off the old self and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. God wants to make us look like him. And we should trust God with the outcome while we try to strive to do what is right in the small scale, in every situation, to do the right thing. We don't use sin as an instrument to try to accomplish good ends. We trust God with the outcome, and we do what's right. All right, here's big number two. Jesus has come to clean up the mess we have made. Jesus has come to clean up the mess we have made. So the Israelites, they were in a mess. I mean, straight up, they, they were in a mess. And we often find ourselves in messes too because we like sin, sin is comfortable, sin is easy, and we end up in huge messes, all of us. And that's a soft word, mess. But it's true, it's true. I think what we think of maybe sometimes when you hear the word mess is like, you know, like a kid's room that's like a little messy. But the truth is that when we live lives of sin, we end up with a mess that is far worse. Like, I'm talking like the septic tank exploded and the living room is destroyed kind of mess. I'm talking about like uh, two raccoons snuck in the window in the night and went to town in the kitchen. That kind of mess. That's the mess we find ourselves in. And so here's, here's the first mess. Well, yeah, God's judgment. Here's A, Jesus can save us from God's judgment. Jesus can save us from God's judgment. Romans 5, 16, I love this. The free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one sin, right, that's Adam's sin, brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. And justification is a really important word. It means that God calls us innocent. That even though we're guilty, God says you're innocent, you're justified, not guilty. So we're justified as a free gift. So Jesus can save us from God's judgment. Because you don't judge somebody who's guilty, I mean who's not guilty, excuse me. If you're innocent, you don't need judgment. You're innocent. And here's the but. So each one of these is going to have a but. But we must trust in his life, death, and resurrection. But we must trust in his life, death, and resurrection. Jesus can save us from God's judgment, but we must trust in his life, death, and resurrection. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So in other words, when we say that we must trust in his life, death, and resurrection, we're saying it's not automatic. You have to take hold of it. But at the same time, you don't have to work for it. You don't have to come and earn salvation and justification. No, no, no. It's a gift. It's a gift of, that comes through faith. Faith is the thing that God uses to give salvation. Here's Romans 5, 1 and 2. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So very clearly, those things come by faith. Faith. So here's the question. Are you trusting in Jesus? Jesus can fix the mess you've made. He can save you from God's judgment. Are you trusting in him? Are you letting him? Are you coming to him and saying, you're the only one who can do this? I'm trusting because you died on the cross for me. You lived a perfect life, and you rose from the dead. You can do it. That's what faith is. That's, that's what the faith we're talking about. So by faith, we're saved from God's judgment. Here's B. Jesus can fix our broken lives. Jesus can fix our broken lives. Now these go in order. You have to be saved from God's judgment before Jesus can fix your broken life. You, you need to be, your, your big mess needs to be cleaned up before Jesus can be able to clean up your little mess. Because the truth is, in the grand scheme of things, our judgment or our, our sin before God is way more of a big deal than however messed up our life might feel in this moment. But Jesus can fix your broken life as well. Here's John 10, 7 through 10. Jesus said to them, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says he came that we may have life and life abundantly. Now, there may be lingering sin, excuse me, lingering consequences of sin in your life, right? If you go live a crazy life of adultery for 10 years, your marriage may still be destroyed. But God can bring peace. He can bring um, some kind of restoration, right? You might restore the relationship. You might find forgiveness. You might find whatever. And God can restore marriages as well. He absolutely can, but sometimes he doesn't. But he can help to clean up the mess and fix the brokenness of that life and give us life abundantly, peace, joy. Here's, here's the but. But we must obey his commands. Jesus can fix our broken lives, but we must obey his commands. Romans 6, 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be unified with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we should no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now the reason I include this verse here is because what he's getting at is this. If God has saved you from sin and is restoring your brokenness and fixing your life, you cannot run around sinning like crazy and expect things to stay that way. For one, that's just an insane thing to do. People who have been saved, who have died and been raised with Christ, they don't run around and live lives of sin anymore. We can't. It just isn't as fun. It's ruined for us. But in the, in the other sense, it's like, imagine that you ask someone to help you clean your house. Let's say your house is destroyed. Let's say absolutely destroyed from years and years of, I don't know, wild animals just coming in and doing whatever they want. Let's say I'm there. I'm helping you clean your house. And as I'm cleaning things, you're going outside, getting the trash from the curb, coming in, cutting the bag open, and just throwing the trash everywhere. That, that's really the picture of a Christian continuing to live in sin. Jesus has come in and said, hey man, let's fix this. I'm, gonna, I'm here to help you kill sin in your life. We're going to clean your house. We're going to give you peace beyond understanding. We're going to give you joy. We're going to give you hope. And you say, mm, but I like the trash. Let me go get some more trash to bring it back in. It's crazy. That's right. Yeah, Jesus can fix our broken lives, but we must obey his commands. We do what he asks us because he knows best. He knows best. He's the one who's come to clean. So we, we do it with him. We kill sin. We clean with him. All right, here's C. So like I said, sometimes consequences linger. Sometimes there's pain that lasts. But Jesus can give purpose to our pain. Jesus can give purpose to our pain, but we must rely on his strength. Jesus can give purpose to our pain, but we must rely on his strength. So he saves us from God's judgment. That's the big mess. Then he fixes our broken lives. That's the, that's, it's still big, but it's smaller. And this is once the house is pretty clean. And, and we're now we're following Christ. We're living in godliness. He has is, he is brought restoration and healing to our lives. But sometimes there are lingering pains from consequences of sin that happened a long, long time ago. But Jesus gives purpose to our pain. Here's 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. The Apostle Paul. He said he got a vision of heaven and God showed him things that he could not describe. 
And so he says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Now notice, it was given to him. Satan didn't come sneak past God's defenses and, and stab him with this thorn. No, no, Paul says, no, this was given to me. A messenger of Satan sent to harass me so that I would not become conceited, that it would accomplish a good end for me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insult, hardship, persecution, and calamity. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Jesus can give purpose to your pain, but you must rely on his strength. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have not left us in our mess but that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, we ask today that you would help us to clean up the messes that we make. We ask that you would not leave us in our sin, but that by whatever means necessary, you would rescue us from that sin, that you would give us victory and freedom. Lord, we thank you that through Christ we have been set free from your judgment. That we can be innocent and justified and not guilty before you because Jesus paid the price on the cross. That he carried our sin on his shoulders and that he died to set us free. And so Lord, today we ask that you would, for those of us here who, who are not trusting in you, that you would give them faith to trust in Jesus as the only one who can save them. And for those of us who are here who are trusting in Jesus, we ask that you would continue, you would continue to hold us, to strengthen us in that faith. Lord, help us to obey your commands so that we can live lives of peace and joy and hope and, and love. Lord, continue to clean us. Continue to show us places that are dirty in our hearts and in our minds and in our souls. Lord, and we ask that you would give us rest and peace even in the midst of pain and sorrow and suffering. Lord, we know that this life is incomplete and that we are still waiting for our ultimate hope, which is the redemption of our bodies at the return of Jesus. But Lord, we ask that now while we are here on this earth, you would help us to rest in you and to trust in you and to receive whatever suffering you have planned for us and to recognize that it is all for our good and for your glory and that you are not wasting any of it. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for all that you are for us in Jesus. And we ask all these things in his holy name. Amen.